Why? Why? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why forsake the majesty and fellowship of heaven? Exchanging a palace for a stable. Immortal comforts for a feeding trough. And robes of glory for the feeble body of an infant. An unparalleled irony, this supreme, unrivaled nobility experiencing absolute and total humility. Our sovereign God, Emmanuel, as a baby. He didn't come to heap shame upon sinners or to judge and cast out the impious, but to break bread with those called unrighteous. He didn't come to illuminate every mystery of the cosmos or to enlighten the intellectual, but to fulfill the testimony of prophets clothed in rags. He didn't come to elevate a single nation or to advocate a particular political affiliation. He came because he saw you broken in need of salvation. He saw you lost and abandoned, crying out, surrounded by deaf ears, fighting through the tears, but beaten down by the torments of this world. And unable to bear your distress, he renounced his eternal throne, walked the earth, bore the stripes, accepted the nails, and gave up his last breath, so that you could receive the breath of life. Our holy, infinite God beheld your pain, perceived your heart, and determined that your soul was worth dying for. From the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb, it is all a story of profound love, of a Savior who rescued his children from darkness, of a blameless king who declared that no sacrifice was too great for the sake of his beloved creation. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came for you. a silent night, a holy night. All is calm and all so bright. Round young virgin, mother and child, holy a silent night, a holy night, all is calm and all so bright, round young bird, mother and child, holy infant so tender and So heaven, sleep in.
lost our heaven sleep in sleep in heaven sleep in sleep in heaven also heaven sleep in heaven also heaven sleep in heaven also heaven sleep in heaven
Welcome to your point of contact for the kingdom of God. I am Pastor Dumai A. Harshaw, Jr., coming to you from First Baptist Church, 101 South Wilmington Street in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, and greet you a most merry and blessed Christmas during this Advent season as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and really the inauguration of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. We believe in that kingdom, and we thank God for his rule, his sovereignty, and his reign. It's present now, and it shall be fulfilled in greater ways in the future. Uh, we celebrate this time because God has demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. But he began in Bethlehem in a manger, and then he grew to maturity, and he is the Messiah the Son of God. And I want to speak to you today about the light of lights as we celebrate Christmas and direct your attention to the ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah, this classic uh, passage of Scripture often lifted up uh, during this uh, season and time of the year in order to point the way as to what the meaning of Christmas is all about. And Christmas is such a special holiday, my favorite holiday, and it was for my mom and dad and my sisters as we grew up. We had phenomenal Christmases uh, because we focused upon the birth of Christ, but also uh, simply because of the love of God that was shed abroad in our hearts as well. And I, my prayer for you is that you would get to the center of the season and the meaning of the season and beyond all the shopping and the gifts and the accounts and the credit cards and the budget, what you can and cannot afford and what you can and cannot do during this time in this particular year of 2020. But focus upon the meaning and focus upon the joy and let this passage of Scripture be a light on your path and be encouragement to your spirit uh, as we read God's Word. Read along with me in your own Bible. I'm reading from the New International um, Translation of this particular text. And we will read the ninth chapter of Isaiah, beginning at verse 2. And it reads like this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest, at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and a government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. And from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and especially the application of his awesome word. Let's bow for a moment in prayer. Dear eternal God, our heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of the year that we can think about your love demonstrated to us and the birth of new beginnings and the birth of a savior, the coming of a child who became a savior and who became the Lord of Lords. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement we receive from your word. We thank you for the light who is Christ in the midst of the darkness of this world? And we rejoice in what you have already done and what you will do in days ahead. Bless your people. Bless your word. 
Bless your word to our hearts and empower us and teach us how to apply it to our current circumstances and especially our everyday lives. And we'll be careful to give your name the praise and we will give you the glory. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. What a mighty word this is indeed. You think of the need for light, and light uh, brings warmth, and it uh, provides guidance, and, and it provides life itself. There's so much in the light. Uh, it guides us, and it ensures that we are walking in ways of safety and security. And we think about the light, we can't help but think about the one who declared in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, and whoever walks with me or walks in the light I provide will never, never suffer the darkness and never, never be separated. And that's the meaning of that passage as Jesus asserts that he has so many centuries ago, and he's saying it today in our lives as well. I am the light. And what a powerful message it was as the commentators help us to understand the context uh, when this word appeared, uh, this word that one said was the great Davidic newness that was declared. And we know in the book of Isaiah, there's so much talk about God's judgment on the people who have been immoral and disobedient. And God then has taken them through the experience of exile. And they've come out of that. And now in the latter part of the book of Isaiah, you get restoration messages and transformation messages and reassurance that the covenant relationship uh, is still in place and never has disappeared, but that God simply disciplines God's people when they get off track with God's will and God's purpose. And so when we come to a passage like this, uh, we rejoice because it's prophecy of what will come. It comes in the ninth chapter, of course, of of Isaiah's prophecy, and then it's really, it culminates with what is then stated in the latter uh, books of Isaiah, and that great promise, and then we see it fulfilled as we read the New Testament in who Jesus is and what Christmas means, and so we celebrate that there's a God who will never let us go, who is always there for us, who seeks to bring us close uh, to God likeness and God's image and really minister to our needs in special ways. And so we see the picture here when we open up the first uh, part of that ninth uh, chapter that there's no more gloom now because something wonderful is taking place. There's no more distress now because God is fulfilling God's promise and God's word. And those who have been locked in patterns of distress and darkness and gloom and anguish now have a good news message coming to them. Things will never be like they were. There's a new beginning and God is doing a new thing. What a marvelous word that is to us today as we come to the end of 2020 and we have suffered the pandemic and we have suffered social uprising, polarization in politics and we have been through difficult times. We have lost so many people and so many loved ones. People have lost businesses and jobs and family members and friendships and so many things have taken place. People have been sick and come out of that with still things that they have to wrestle with because of the virus and what it's done uh, to their precious bodies. And we got people who work uh, from morning to evening in the midnight hours caring for other human beings and ministering at bedsides and weeping as they see people transition. This has been a difficult year and it's been a difficult time. There's none like it that any of us living during this time have experienced. And so we can relate to the notion of distress and, and gloom. We think of parents and the great load upon them to, be, to do homeschooling. And we think of the educators and what they have been through and administrators and our school systems of one kind or another who have really had a burden and really have had difficult times figuring out which way to go and, and how to care for students but also to support parents. And we just think of the long lines of people who uh, 
signing up for unemployment and even anything that the government can do in our prayers that they would do it quickly still is not enough to pay bills and to keep people from being evicted and losing the place, the place they call home. These are difficult times, and uh, we have lived through a lot during this year, and we don't know what tomorrow holds with or without a vaccine. We don't know what the new year will look like, but we know that God has promised newness in what he has done in Christ and what he has done in the past, he can certainly do again. We don't have all the answers for why we have gone through. We don't have all the answers why precious people, even children and healthy adults and seniors and people all over the globe have been lost due to this pandemic. We don't understand, and the hymnist wrote, we'll understand it better by and by. But one thing we know that even in the midst of such circumstances, there's peace in the Word of God. Uh, there's security in the promises of God. And there's hope even in the midst of the most despairing realities that still we live as hope. And that's the meaning of the light that comes at Christmas time. It's beautiful to see the lights and, and the battle for who has the greatest light in the neighborhood. And people ride in caravans to see beautiful expressions of the colors of the rainbow you know, on homes that that exhibit uh, the meaning of the season, and it's a beautiful thing. But then there is the light of lights, and that is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that this is what this passage uh, is all about when it talks about another chance for God's people, the covenant people, the people of faith who God has delivered again and again, that now they have another chance there's another chance of something happening. And this book of Isaiah and this particular ninth chapter and this section reminds us of the former things and the latter things and what God is doing by his grace and his mercy. On the one hand, you have oppression and you have failure of a whole nation and even a whole culture and a whole people. And yet on the other hand, you have the promise of peace and prosperity and gain and new beginnings. And that's the beauty of preaching and sticking to the good news gospel and the word of God. Because no matter what you're going through at any time in your life, there's a new thing that God is able to do that God has promised to do it. God is doing. And so that's where our hope is. And that's where we stay focused regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. This is not the, the end because God is able to do amazing things. And that was the promise for the people there. And so we see articulated in this passage a radical, decisive break with the past. And all of us, as we enter by God's grace, a new year, 2021, we want a break from 2020. We don't want to live another year like we've lived this year. But more than that, we want to be recipients of what God is doing by his grace and the provisions that are made through God's plan of salvation and what he's doing to prepare us for eternity and for what God has promised. And so the, the times described here in the ninth uh, chapter of this beautiful book of Isaiah is, is the darkness relative to the evil and the disobedience of the people of faith and the fact that everything they own has been stolen from them. They've been dislocated. They have given up property and housing, and they, they, they've had to see their families separated. They've worried about their children. They've worried about their marriages and relationships because of being assaulted by other nations and divided uh, and being at war and losing war even. And yet God's word comes to them and God promises a great light and a great new beginning. And so we see that in that second verse. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And this seeing of this great light is a, a posture of faith and an answer to prayer. And, and it's not necessarily in the natural. It, it really isn't talking about the beauty of the sun but it's talking about the presence of God in history and time to deliver, to uplift, to comfort, to lead, to guide. 
even in the midst of all that they are going through, a light, a great light now has emerged and the people have seen that. That means they don't have to complain anymore. That means they don't have to be discouraged any longer. They don't have to be de depressed any longer because those living in the land of deep darkness, this light has dawned. And as a result, there's enlargement that comes. There's increase that comes. And it's time uh, to be rejoicing. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's like people who are gathered in happiness when their produce comes through in maturity, and then they have resources to take to the market to feed their own families, but also to make money in order to take care of their businesses and their families and their family members. And it's like those who are warriors who are weary of fighting other nations and weary of bloodshed. And now there's a new thing coming because now peace is promised and God is doing a new thing says, as in the day of Midian's defeat, uh, you, have, you have shattered the yoke. And now it's talking to the Lord himself, rehearsing what God has done. You have shattered the yoke and the burden that burdens them. Now all the, the burdens on their shoulders and the bar across their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor has been broken by the power of God stepping into their history, the power of God's word being delivered by the prophet, the power of the promise of God for a people that he will not let go, he will not abandon in any way. And that's our story too when we think about the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an eternal transaction and God will not desert us now. The Lord will show up in a mighty way and that's what we celebrate and that's what we rejoice over. Every warrior's boot used in battle now and the garment rolled in blood now will be destined for burning fuel for the fire because something new and wonderful is taking place. Someone has noted three moments, as, as you will, three, three movements that take place uh, in this book of Isaiah around these chapters. The, number one, the spectacular newness in their sociological and political reality. Nothing is going to be the same. So that you see, God doesn't just talk about spiritual things, but, but he also talks about natural things like freedom and justice and righteousness and, and God's new way, that God talks about other things in order to liberate God's people and move in their hearts in a mighty way. And the second thing is a transformation that is promised where God is going to then uh, raise up a new military, a new army to protect the people of God and not allow any assaults any longer to the community, which is God's community and God's people. And then thirdly is that royal agent, that servant, the servant of all servants, the suffering servant, the Lamb of God. Uh, Yahweh will send a deliverer and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He inaugurates the kingdom of God. And look how it's described in this passage. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be responsible. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. You can go to him 24-7. The mighty God. He has awesome power to do something about the battles you go through in your life. The everlasting Father, one who nurtures you and cares for you and lifts you. And the Prince of Peace, who brings peace to your heart, peace to your spirit, and peace to the world around you by his awesome power and by his edict, as it were. And of the greatness of this government, it says, there will be no end. It's in the line and heritage of David, selected by divine selection in order to bless not only God's people, but the entire universe and the entire world. And I like the way the psalmist said in Psalm 126, just reflecting upon what God has done when he breaks into your history and mine, when he shows up in the midst of our battles and our circumstances, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion 
the psalmist cries out, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. Like streams in the Negev, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Songs like what we find in Psalm 96, where it says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day and night. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering yourself. Bring an offering all, all of your money. Bring an offering to the Lord. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the nations of the earth. Sing among the nations. The Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And the psalmist declares, let the heavens rejoice. And we say it this Christmas as well. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let your Christmas tree sing for the joy of the Lord. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, hallelujah, he comes to judge the earth. And that's what we need right now. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Glory, hallelujah, for what God has done in Jesus Christ. The light of lights. He says, I am the light of the world. I'll lead you into that light. I'll bless you with that light. I'll let that light show, shine all around you. And then you'll have a song to sing. Then you'll have a story to tell. Then you'll have a testimony. Not like the way it's said in the hymn, Jesus, the light of the world. Hark the herald, angels sing. Jesus, the light of the world. Glory to the newborn king. Jesus, the light of the world. We'll walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Is he your light today? Is he shining in your heart today? Is he ministering to your needs today? Let him shine. Let your light shine. Tell somebody how good God is and what the Lord has done for you. For he is the light of all lights. Hallelujah. And all you need to do is say yes to the Lord and let him shine in your heart. So how can I get the joy of the Lord? Let Jesus come into your heart. Let him step into your station in life. Let him show up in your history. Let God into your home, into your marriage, into your family, into your relationship. Let God into your ambitions for your future. Let the Lord shine because when he shines, darkness cannot put it out. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the light of lights we thank you, Jesus, that you are the light of the world. Shine in us, shine around us, shine above us, below us, behind us, in front of us. But shine, O oh Lord, in the midst of any darkness that threatens. And we'll be careful to give your name the praise. And we will give you the glory. For it is in the majestic name of Jesus Christ, 
our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Merry Christmas.